Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this presentation of the honorary doctorate from the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. May I have your applause for the representatives of the academic authorities, academia and Flemish Minister for Education, Pascal Smet. Following the initiative of the academic authorities and Proxima Professor Vivian Jonkers, Professor Londa Schiebinger. Following the initiative of the academic authorities and Proxima Professor Yvette Michot, Mrs. Fatou Bensouda. Following the initiative of the Exact Sciences and Proxima Professor Katrien de Klerk, Professor Cecilia Gileskog. Following the initiative of the Humanities and Proxima Dr. Yasmina Sermain, Professor Carol Gilligan. Following the initiative of the Medical Sciences and Proxima Professor Verle de Bosser, Mrs. Kim Kleisters. And finally, may I have your applause for Professor Paul de Knop, Rector, and Eddie van Gelder, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the presentation of the 2013 Honorary Doctorate of the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. A special welcome to five exceptional women who will be presented with a Dr. Honoris Casa degree in the next hour. Londa Schiebinger, Fatou Bensouda, Cecilia Jarosko, Carol Gilligan, and Kim Classes. We have a long tradition of presenting honorary doctorates to outstanding and inspiring personalities in recognition of their achievements in the academic, scientific, or social field. Personalities who match our baseline, redelijk eigenzinnig in Dutch, which translates to reasonably self-willed. The slogan refers to the free spirit of our university, to the principles of free inquiry and critical thinking. We also have a long list of women who were awarded by our university, from Marlene Demmerman last time, to the Egyptian feminist writer Naval El Sadawi, politician Sonia Gandhi, or choreographer Anteris de Keersmaker. But I must admit, most of the doctores honoris causa are men. And it shouldn't be like that. I think we all agree on this. With this year's honorary awards, the VUB wants to contribute to a fairer balance when it comes to gender. But that's not the reason why these five women were chosen by the academic authorities and by the humanities, the exact and the medical sciences. You ladies are chosen because you are simply brilliant in what you did and still do. I wish you all an inspiring awards ceremony. Thank you. Voor de meeste van die eredoctoraten zijn er eigenlijk drie organen of drie lichamen die moeten beslissen dat dat wordt uitgereikt. Het eerste, dat is iets heel specifiek dat wij hier ook op de VUB hebben, is een senaat. Senatu. Senatu Actore. Excententia Structurae Conciliaria Scientiarum Humanarum. Ah ja, het is veranderd. 
l'arrondissement. Il y a tout ma belle, c'est Bézi. Et au Kilo Studio Universitatis Assentiente. Nos pas du tout. Recto Studio Universitatis. Et Eduard van Gelder. Dat is Concili Universitari. Oké, okay, je weet dat de namen in het Latijn omzetten altijd een beetje moeilijkheid is. Wat we sowieso doen, zijn de familienamen, de achternamen, altijd laten zoals ze zijn. Mijn naam is Schiebinger. Fatou Ben Souda. Kilian Janskoek. Carola Mkilia. En voor de naam Kim, daar zou je kunnen twijfelen tussen Kim Berleia of Joachima. En we hebben daar nu maar een boos voor. Joachima Mkilesis. Joachima Dr. Honoris Causa, hoe dat in het Latijn weer te geven. Woorden op tor hebben een vrouwelijke pendant op trix. Dus waarom niet doctrigen voor deze gelegenheid? Honoris Causa. Doctrigen honoris causa, criamus et renuntiamus. Hoes re, het vuur was het, dat had het bestaat, dat had het bestaat. Maar het is diploma, roma, kikoens. Per gratum rei testimonium, dat dat een doorhuis. En zo zijn we ten einde en moeten we alleen nog de datum noemen. Bruxelles, die duo de tricesimo, mensis maio, anno bisilesimo, tertio decimo. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We may say that the presentation of the honorary doctorates is quite exceptional. Five women will be awarded today, and that is the first time in Belgian academic history. Rector Paul de Knop has made his choice with conviction, and I will ask him why. Rector Paul de Knop. Was the number of highly qualified men so small that you had to choose five women? No, not at all. You have to see it as a statement, uh, a statement that we take uh, gender equity, equity very seriously. And we do it. We already did in the past, as our president said, but we wanted to make a statement that we have to work more on this uh, gender uh, equity. Okay, now the Verne Universiteit Brussel will change its system to nominate candidates for the honorary uh, doctorates. How will this work in the future? Well, I'm going to propose of our board of directors to change the rules in that order that each faculty will have to uh, present a man and a woman. And so it means that on the board of the university we can make a choice so that we, have, uh, we can ensure this equality between men and women. Now it is known, Belgian universities do a very bad job in keeping women aboard as professors. In fact, only 13% of the professors are female in this country. Is the situation better here? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, no, to be honest, uh, we are on average. We have done a lot in the past, so we had one of the first uh, female rectors already. Uh, at our university, it was uh, Professor Els Witte. I have chosen to have two vice rectors female and two vice rectors men. Uh, we have also in the Board of Education uh, about uh, one third are women. And uh, also in the Board of uh, Research, we had the first uh, female uh, president of the student board. And we have at this moment the first uh, female dean of the Faculty of Engineering. Mm. It's uh, Annick Huben. Okay, so the institutions are not bad, but still no professors. Well, we have professors, but we have to improve the number. And uh, we have to work at the dropout of uh, female professors after finishing their PhD, after their uh, postdoc uh, uh, period. How will you keep them? Well, we will set up an own action plan. The, we will try to uh, put a female more in front, like for instance in events, in publications, but we will also work out some uh, regulations for the faculty and uh, for the staff in general. But I have to say that the VB is doing well because in management uh, the men are almost uh, disappearing. Almost disappearing? Yeah, yeah uh, we have very, very strong news. women, very <laughs> strong women in management, uh, in yeah. education, in research in internationalization and, and so on and so forth. Okay, Paul de Knop, now we know what you think about gender issues. Let's look at your students. 
I would be a doctor in medicine. Every specification has is better for a woman or for men, but it's not spe a specific uh, woman or man's job. I will try to find a job which involves traveling. Um, I want to become a financial advisor. Well, those are strong positions, so they're probably associated with men. So I study uh, business engineering. Uh, I think it's a man's world, not a man's job. Uh, I think most people who are engineers are men, but it can also be women, of course. Uh, psychology. I don't think you can uh, assign a profession to gender. A lawyer. A lawyer. Uh, no, not at all. I don't think so, no. Women, women can uh, argue very well. Ooh, difficult question. Um, I want to do something in the music business or the TV business. You, you see a lot of men on the screen, but I want to work behind the scenes, so... Is it normal that you're asking that question? Um, no, not really. I think all jobs can be done by any gender. I think nowadays it won't be a normal question, but before 30 years, yes. I think in this world, in the 21st century, we all know that those things are changing and the women are taking over, so... I want to become a lawyer. Guys, get a job, get a wife, get a little garden, get a dog, and they can basically keep on living the same life. And women have to like give up a lot of stuff if they want to have like both worlds. A businessman. Well, I, I, will, I will combine it uh, very well. I won't be. A, I won't have a housewife who do all the things. I will combine it so uh, she also get a, can have a great career. As a businessman, will won't stay home for kids, or he will have a wife that stays home. If you plan a good with your wife, I think it's possible. Well, I'm doing my PhD right now, so I'd like to continue research. Once I have a child, I want to take care of it. So if that means that. I have to make sacrifices for the family, that's something that I'm open to as well. And you gotta see with your wife, how, how will she work and, uh, and then yeah, get some arrangements uh, between you two, so we'll be working then and then. Nobody asked me that question, uh, if I could combine uh, both things. No, actually not. <laughs> You're the first, so uh, congratulations. <laughs> All women become mothers and a lot of guys also become fathers, so... No, it's no question for me. Uh, I have to recognize that uh, at first the, the question seems more logic to women uh, than to men, but yeah. The idea of society is that a woman should become a mother, and I think that's completely wrong because children need their father just as much. Times do change, so maybe one time it will seem logic, or uh, that uh, you, you also question both persons. Something to think about. That brings us to the first question of the day. Do we need to enforce gender equality? Today, we will um, ask you several times to think about a dilemma. And the game works as follows. You need to find out what your neighbor thinks about the dilemma. You have about one minute. We have a clock ticking to measure the time. And after that, I will go into the audience and I will ask some of you what your neighbor thinks. So, the first question is, do we need to enforce gender equality? Time goes now. Tell 
So we really believe that we have to enforce it. Women are not there uh, on the top of the universities or of the companies, wherever. But we don't like positive discrimination either. So we like to be chosen because of our qualities. So um, be careful. No quotas. No quotas. No, I don't say no quotas, because quotas can help us, but not because uh, we don't like to be in the quotas because only because we are women, but because we are strong and because we are competent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Uh, you lady with a brown jacket, can I ask you what your neighbor has told you? <coughs> My both neighbors are quite... Uh, had the share a similar vision. Uh, they are against quota, I think. They also uh, feel that there should be uh, measures to impose gender equality, although they didn't tell me how they don't solve it unless <laughs> they would impose quota. So I wonder about that. And all what you always hear is uh, the issue about quality. Mm -hmm. uh, measures to impose equality are good, but let's look at the quality first. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you very much. I would like to ask this question also to um, Professor Catherine de Klerk, because she's a pioneer in the Council uh, of Women. I'm looking for her. I'm looking for Mrs. de Klerk. Can I ask you? Do but first, for the record, the Council of Women doesn't already exist. Oh, I wish you didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in 2010, for the 100th anniversary of uh, International Women's Day, we created a women's network at the UK. That's probably what you refer to, so I'm the coordinator. And there was uh, a council for um, when we were asked by a director to make a list of uh, the honorary doctors of today. Okay. That's, we hope it will still exist in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and do we need to enforce gender equality? Is it something that we really should work for? Well, I will give you my personal opinion. I, um, I think that every talented person has the right to have a career up to the highest top. And this seems not to happen only for a minority. And minorities do not feel well. So if we want to change that, we have to change habits. And I think we need something to enforce the present community to open up, to accept more women. And I don't say that um, they, they do it on purpose. It's just, for me, it is a question of habits, and habits is an automatism. So you, if, you want, if you wait for habits to change, you will wait a long time. If you want things to change now, I think you need to enforce mm -hmm. it and quotas are a way. I know we don't like it because it's sometimes used against us, but it seems to be, in my experience, the only thing that works. Okay, it's going to you slowly. Thank you for your openness. High time, uh, time now to award uh, the first lady, and that is Professor Londa Schiebinger. This is what her Proxima wants to share with us. When you are discussing gender in science, that it's not about complaining, it's not fair that we do not address women or that we do not have women, or um, even the, the debate on whether women do science differently. We are here today because we are awarding an honorary doctorate to Londa Schiebinger, who is an historian of science and who has been uh, studying uh, the influence uh, of uh, gender on uh, science. For example, the seat belts in your car are rather harmful to very short people and to pregnant women. It is basically about its better research if you take into account the full population. Londa Schiebinger is also uh, internationally recognized for her efforts to put gender and gender analysis in science on the agenda of governments and other uh, funding agencies. What you see today eh, is that if you look at the uh, population um, 
of our students. Yeah? We slightly have more women than boys. There's no problem with the influx of female students. But then as you continue up the career ladder, uh, then you see less and less and less participation of female. So that's that famous uh, scissor model. Um, and it is um, important uh, to emphasize with the type of research that Londa Schiedinger has been doing that uh, just quota is not necessarily the only and the right answer uh, to uh, the problems. It's important for the VUB as an institution, as a university, uh, because uh, it um, uh, addresses the actual uh, debate uh, and it is important for us uh, individual academics uh, because it uh, matters to our uh, daily life. Londa Schiebinger, uh, as a renowned uh, academic, she wrote many books in her career. But there's uh, a seminal book she wrote in 1999 with the title Has Feminism Changed Science? Question mark. 1999 is uh, almost 15 years ago. So may I ask you now, what do you think? Did feminism change science? have a seat in the sofa and um, have a talk. Please, yes, please, perfect like this. Yes, perfect. I'm going to give you this. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, I would like to hear your opinion on the dilemma that your Proxima Professor Jonkers has launched. Did feminism change science? That's a complicated question. To the extent that we support equality for women, I think, yes, that feminism has changed science. But today, in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you some more. And I have for you a recipe of how to change your university. And now it includes going further and incorporating gender analysis into research design. This is where the action is today. So in 15 years, I come back and see how you're doing. But can one improve research if you have an eye for gender bias? Uh, it's not an eye for gender bias. I think it's an eye for gender analysis. This is not something just women do. It is something that you learn. It should be in the university curriculum. Everyone needs to understand the position, attitudes, and behaviors of men and women in society, and we need to design our research to, to benefit both men and women equally. Could you give an example um, of where it went wrong if you take that into, uh, into account? What went wrong? What went wrong yes, in what science? Went, what went wrong in science is quite alarming. Uh, recently, 10 drugs were withdrawn from the U.S. market because of very severe health effects, and eight of those drugs had more severe effects in women. 
Developing these drugs is both expensive and really harming. Developing these drugs costs billions of dollars, which are lost when the research is done incorrectly, and when the drugs fail, people suffer and die. So we really can't afford to get the research wrong. That's but shocking. we need to know. <laughs> yes, that's shocking. It really is, yes. Now, how can you get more women into science? We can get more women into science. So for the research I was just mentioning, we actually need more female mice. You know, it's not just the women we need. <laughs> it's really very simple. Um, but to get more women into research, so in a, in a few minutes, I'll be giving some remarks. And we need to not only recruit and retain the women, but we need to fix the institutions. That is to say, you have to transform your institution your basic structures and practices so that women can flourish as much as men at the university. And then most importantly, you have to fix the knowledge. It's not fine to have the same research projects um, and ask women to just fit into them. You have to be open to new research priorities and directions. And that's what's exciting because then you get innovation. Now, if you want to hear more about uh, Rhonda Schiebinger, yesterday I interviewed uh, Mrs. Schiebinger for Canal Z. You can see it this weekend on the website of Canal Z or on television the 3rd of August. We really had fun yesterday. <laughs> and you will see in a nutshell what the work of Rhonda Schiebinger is all about. Now, again, congratulations. Thank you. I would like to present to you the following honorary doctor, Fatou Ben Souda, a Proxima event Michot, will tell you more about her. We have our moral values, and our moral duty is fight against uh, injustice. We selected uh, Mrs. Fatou Ben Souda, and she's an African woman. She um, was born in uh, Gambia. And uh, she knows very well the, the situations there. And I think that one of the reasons why I, I proposed her is because she stands, she stands up for victims. She asks also for participation of the victim in the trials. They can go and witness there. So they have a voice. Rape and violence against uh, women is used as a war weapon. It's very well known. It's not only in Africa, of course. We have known it in the Yugoslavia war. We know it's just the same. And raping women is just a, an act of war and is used as, as a weapon. In 2012, she was sworn in as chief prosecutor at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. She was elected um, not because she was a woman, not because she was African, but because she was engaged, because she had a mission, and because she was very, very uh, qualified. She was the right, she's the right person in the right place. Um, it's a very high position. And her mission is to bring into court all these perpetrators of uh, war crimes, crimes against uh, humanity, crimes against women and children, I noticed, and I, I will read it, because I noticed in an interview of her, what she said, my fight, my fight is, is to, to use the full force of the law to systematically, consistently, and firmly ensure that perpetrators are punished and victims, and victims are recognized. recognized. Of course, we select excellent persons. And uh, Mrs. Bensuda, in her field, I think it's excellent. You have to be excellent to fight for this and to go for it. Well, uh, Professor Yvette Michaud, thank you for this message, uh, for this introduction. Now, um, we would like to see uh, Mrs. Bensuda, of course, but she could not be here. And you were going to tell us about that, but your voice is gone? It's gone. <laughs> We're so sorry. <laughs> okay, but uh, Fatou Ben Souda, prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda, has sent us a message. We will see him. Now. Thank you to the Free University of Brussels for bestowing upon me this honorary doctorate, which I happily accept with humbleness and gratitude. Unfortunately, 
I can't be with you in person today, as engagements in court require my presence in The Hague. But it is my pleasure to address you via this video message during this festive ceremony. I am thankful for the university's appreciation for my work as prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, and in particular, for the recognition of the court's contribution to achieving peace. Indeed, the creation of the International Criminal Court was rooted in the desire to prevent a repeat of human suffering triggered through decades of massive crimes affecting the peace, security, and well-being of the world. The mandate of the Office of the Prosecutor is to ensure accountability for those who bear the greatest responsibility for the commission of the most serious crimes. In doing so, the Office takes into account the nature of the crimes, in particular, where it involves sexual violence, gender violence, or violence against children. I am grateful that our efforts to fight these types of crimes have been acknowledged by the university. I have pledged my office's commitment to continue to lead efforts to ensure these crimes are given the priority they deserve. Too often, their existence is denied or ignored, and their victims shamed. In some settings, it is as if there were a tacit agreement to look the other way as women and children suffer sexual abuse, minimizing, trivializing, denigrating, and silencing the victims, destroying their credibility, and further violating their dignity so abusers can continue unimpeded. The International Criminal Court, however, signals to the world that now, at last, this deal is off. I see and commend the growing international impetus triggering various initiatives on combating and preventing sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict situations. The challenge, however, will be how to accelerate the excruciatingly slow change in prevailing social attitudes towards women in general and sexual and gender violence in particular. This is the question I share with you today. How can we, as the international community, working together, bring change, real and sustainable change, for the women and for victims of sexual and gender crimes? I think we all have a role to play, and I am curious to hear your views in this regard. Congratulations, Fatou Ben Souda. And this was a question for you, ladies and gentlemen. Can we bring sustainable change for the victims of gender crimes? What does your neighbor think about this? I will ask you in a minute. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, your time is up now. Can I ask this gentleman what your neighbor has told you about um, bringing sustainable change for the victims of gender crimes? Yes, uh, it might be um, a simple question, but it's uh, really difficult. It's a tough one, uh, it's a tough one yes. Um, and um, the answer of my neighbor is that uh, we need uh, to, to focus on, 
on education uh, to start really early uh, with children uh, and to bring uh, really uh, e equity between um, uh, sexes uh, in, in, in the education of uh, children. I hope I'm more or less uh, <laughs> give you a thing. <laughs> you agree. I think uh, education, um, the family, is very important. And also, of course, uh, uh, the culture and the openness to other cultures and, and other people uh, so that there isn't a brother and a sisterhood with the other person. And I think when there is a kind of a family or a sister or a brother link with the other person, uh, it may help because there is an understanding. And when people understand each other, there will be, I believe, less crime. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you, Mr. Valley, what your neighbor has shared with you? Well, we thought there were two situations. There is the problem uh, of war. I mean, we, we think we can sustainably change the, the attitude to gender and, and, and stop crime outside of war. I think thinking about how to stop war, and that would help stopping crimes against gender, I think. Mm -hmm. And how do you stop war? Ha <laughs> ha. That we didn't discuss. <laughs> yeah, one minute is too short. Thank you very much. Now, coincidentally, we have a male professor in this room who is an expert in finance matters. And even more coincidental is that he's the husband of Professor Kara Gilligan, who will receive her honorary doctorate later this hour. Now, Professor James Gilligan. What is it that you would like to share with us on this topic? Well, I'd like to make the point that the uh, most effective way to help the victims of gender crimes is to prevent them from becoming victims in the first place. And the way to do that is to change the education, the acculturation, the socialization uh, of men, uh, primarily. Of women, too, certainly. Um, but I think we have to, uh, I, I'm speaking on the basis of experience working with violent criminals who have uh, committed crimes against women. We found that uh, we could uh, change their behavior uh, by engaging in groups that questioned their beliefs about what it took to be a man. Sorry that I interrupt you, but how are you going to change men? <laughs> the way we did change men, and we were able to show them that we could, was by engaging in intensive, what we call deconstruction and reconstruction of the, what we call the male role belief system, the set of assumptions they had about how you define masculinity, what, what people have to do in order to prove that they really are men. Once these violent criminals did, got the point, I was amazed how quickly they got it, and then they went and started educating the new guys who were coming into the jails and the prisons. And uh, they became teachers for the new guys. So, was, but uh, all I can say about that is, the jails and prisons were like a laboratory in which to learn things. Could then it could then be applied in society at large. This then needs to uh, uh, permeate the whole society, including the educational system, which is why I think what you're doing here today in emphasizing women is a way to help the victims of gender crimes and to help them stop them from becoming victims in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Send your name, James Gilligan. And of course, um, congratulations again for the very brave Fatou Ben Souta of Thoughts All We Have Today. And another brave woman, although I should say girl, that was that has no gender crimes since she was born is Malala Yousafzai. The Vrije Universiteit Brussel was deeply impressed by the fight she has waged in Pakistan. For children's rights and children's rights to education, a strife that almost killed her. 
The Vrije Universiteit Brussel has recently written a letter in which Rector Paul Knop invites her for free tuition at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. The scholarship comprises the fee for the tuition as well as her residence and travel costs. The university does this as a tribute for her courage. This is her story. i 
ladies and gentlemen, the sound you heard is from the Belgian Post, modern rock group Amatorsky. And these days they are trying to reinvent themselves. They explore the borders between different art, art disciplines and they even invite us listeners to co-create their music. Check their website. And now I would really love to know who the Swedish professor Cecilia Charleskog is. Uh, Proxima Professor Katrine Glerk will tell us more about her. Somehow, the antimatter has disappeared. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. If you talk about the Big Bang to a three-year-old child, he will be interested because he wants to know. I have always been interested in um, the origin of things. Fundamental research is important. Uh, you see, it's, it's um, hmm. the whole society owns this knowledge. And it, uh, it's like uh, a seed for uh, developments in the future. Our group here, the Experimental Institute, which is the Inter-University Institute for High Energies, has had a relation with Cecilia Jarlskog over the years already since a long time. So we have like some history together. She is more than a theorist working, uh, developing models for the particle physicists. She has been a member of the Nobel Committee for Physics. She worked at CERN and she's in fact, I think, more a mathematician than a physicist. She lives with mathematics. That's, she's breathing mathematics. Um, she's also a woman and um, she has been active in um, attracting the attention to the uh, presence of women in physics where we are a minority. <laughs> but we are more numerous than antiparticles in the universe. She is uh, a particle physicist. One of her main domains of interest, I would say, is uh, symmetry in nature. I will um, get a fight with my theory friends, <laughs> but they try to describe nature in a few equations. These equations are simple, they are based on symmetry, so there is always as much matter as antimatter in a, a neutral universe. But somehow, the antimatter has disappeared. This mystery of the missing antimatter is very fundamental. It has to do with our daily lives, and the history tells us that it will, um, that it will change society in the future. We want to solve the mystery, and that's one of the things that Cecilia Jalsko is working on, and that's the question she wants to ask to the public. What happened to the antimatter in the universe? Nos Paulus de Knop, Rector Studiorum Universitatis, et Eduardus van Gelder Prizes Concili Universitari. Cecilia Jarosko, Doctricem Honoris Causa, Creavimus et Renutiavimus. Applaudamus. Professor Jarosko, Professor de Klerk, let's have a seat. Congratulations. Sorry. Okay, can I give this to you? Okay, so this is a very intriguing question. Where is all the antimatter in the universe? I had no idea people loved antimatter so much. You know, I couldn't understand. They seem to be very excited about it. That's really great. You are not excited about it? Well, I'm afraid of it, you see. Because suppose some creature would come from a different name galaxy and would like to shake hands with me and if I don't know if the person is matter or antimatter, I don't think I would like to shake hands with him. Fortunately, you here at the university are all matter and you, know, you should be very grateful for that, that you're made of matter and not antimatter because we are living in a hostile world for antimatter. Antimatter has been created around us all the time but we are so hostile to it, we just kill it. We just kill it. Yes, we do. We annihilate it, yes. And so we should be very grateful. If you're a believer, 
You should pray every day before you go to bed. <laughs> Thank the creation for having made you into matter and not antimatter. Mm. Yes. Now, where has it gone? Yeah, that's your yeah. question. Yeah. I wish I knew. If I knew, I would have gotten the Nobel Prize, you know. Yeah. Yes. I could and go to Stockholm. Yes. That would be nice. A potential Marie Curie here in. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. She's one of my favorites, by the way. She's yeah. absolutely fantastic lady. If you haven't read about her, you don't know about her, you should really do that. She was a true pioneer. She was living in a very difficult time. She was very much under attack. And she really opened up for women, as nobody else has done. And she was, yeah, I, 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 I usually give talks about her, but I don't think I'm going to do it now. OK. <laughs> now, um, let's broaden the topic. Um, starting from the search for the missing untied letter, we turn to the premise of the search itself. You embarked on this search on the premise that there must be symmetry in nature. Now tell us about symmetry. Why? Is it about beauty or convenience? Well, I mean, it's just that I think that we are brought up with symmetry, all of us. And when you see a person has two eyes, one is on one side, one is on the other side. The nose, we have just one, at least most of us, just in the middle, right? And the mouth as well. And so we have some sort of axial symmetry. But the symmetries in physics are a little bit different. Uh, for example, suppose you were just a tiny, tiny little creature, and your universe was just a circle. You were living on that. There was nothing inside, nothing outside. You know, you would have a symmetry. Because all the points in the universe would be equivalent with each other. They were all equivalent. That's a question of symmetry. And so this sort of symmetries described in mathematical forms, they become, they become very, very important. And it turns out that even you can describe the laws of nature as, as if they are emerging from these symmetries. And this sort of thing it leads, for example, to the existence of light. It sounds like us too. I know, it is, it is. It is. So symmetry has been extremely useful up to now. Of course, we have no guarantee that's going to help us in the future as well. You don't know, maybe some very asymmetric sort of theory will pop out someplace, and the universe will be very, very different. But we don't know. But up to now, you should have bought stocks in symmetry. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Would you like to know the opinion of the audience on this? Yes, why not? Okay. I would like to present this question to an physician, and that is Professor Willem Elias. Professor Elias. Okay, Professor Elias. Symmetry, something to seek or to avoid? I think it's... Uh... <coughs> A very simple question. Um, it's hard to compare natural principles on one side and cultural rules, really different system of order. But I understand your question is simple, but, but not stupid. Interesting question. Interesting question. Just because during years, the, what we call the academic art, the sea research of the artists was just to find that symmetry in nature, uh, the natural symmetry to find it. But modern art just is the contrary, is in fact the, uh, is the idea that you have several symmetries and that also asymmetry can be very interesting in art. So, but, but can scientists learn from art? A lot of, I think, because that's just the obscurity of art is very interesting for the clarity of scientists. Can you explain that? A good example, too. Uh, the difference between uh, a trash can and a piece of art that is made with the content of the trash can is just a way of a very obscure relationship between elements that in fact the scientists cannot study and they cannot see it, but the artist can see it. <laughs> and, uh, I have no student the editor. Willem Elias, thank you very much. Professor Cecilia Charles Cog, congratulations again. We were delighted to talk here with you. Enjoy this day.
Professor Carol Gilligan, ladies and gentlemen, is about to receive her honorary doctorate. Dr. Yasmina Sermen shall reveal what the question, what question she has installed for her and for you. We notice that in our society that there are more and more differences. The diversity is growing on the one hand. On the other hand, we notice also that people and policy makers are trying to neutralize these differences. For example, by forbidding uh, the wearing of religious symbols. Now, I want to ask you if you think this is an appropriate way to deal with those uh, of this diversity in our society. We are here uh, to, to talk about a famous woman, uh, Carol Gilligan, um, who is getting an honorary doctorate. And in 1982, she wrote a book in a different voice about gender stereotypes that are existing in the traditional psychology. She shows us that the traditional psychology, but also the psychology of today, assumes and is writing from a male perspective, a dominant male perspective. She brought in the women's voices in the conversation. So Gilligan um, was one of the founders of gender studies, and gender studies are studies that are exploring and researching uh, themes um, about gender differences and also gender stereotypes, um, yeah, gender stereotypes between men and women. She showed us that there are differences between men and women, uh, they think in a different manner, and when in our society we see that women are um, trying a lot to be like men. She's the woman who shows us in psychology that uh, we, we have to think broader. We have to take up the voices of the marginalized groups and don't build theories on just the uh, white middle class men. Brussels is known as a university that is thinking also in terms of differences and in terms of thinking out of the box. And that's what Gilligan does very much, I think. Yeah. So, it's a beautiful link with the baby. In our respected audience, I would like to hear from you again. The question is, is it appropriate to neutralize human diversity? Please? Ask your neighbor, I will get back to you in one minute. Society is growing, and yet society tends to neutralize all these differences. Is that a good idea? Can I ask Rector Paul van Kouwen from the University of Kent? Can I ask him? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I think it's uh, a, a question that maybe should not be posed because uh, the answer of most of the people present here uh, is, I think, uh, very clear. We should not neutralize it. We should uh, stimulate it uh, because it makes uh, our world and our life uh, uh, more fun, more livable and uh, for humankind uh, diversity should be there and uh, should, be, should be stimulated. Uh, so an easy, too easy question, I guess. Too easy question. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Then. <laughs> now, Rector, both the group, we have all our attention. Nos Paulus de Knop, Rector Studiorum Universitatis et Eduardus van Gelder, Praesas Consili Universitari, Carola Gilligan, Doctoricem Honoris Causa, Creavimus et Renutiavimus. Applaudamus. Doctor Honoris Causa, Carol Gilligan. Please, Dr. Gilligan. Dr. Semmel, let's have a seat. My best wishes. Thank you. Now, how important is your university? How important? Mm -hmm. Very important. <laughs> Easy question. Easy question. Okay, I should give you the microphone, otherwise oh, nobody, nobody can hear us. Okay, so human diversity is very important. Yes, I write about voice, and everybody has a voice. It's extremely important that everyone has a voice that is listened to and heard with respect. Yeah. Yet, society tends to neutralize diversities. Politicians tend to do these things because it's easier to neutralize the you know, diversity. The diversity. We had a wonderful the photograph of Malala. I mean, she was wearing a headscarf, but she had a very big voice. OK. So it's inappropriate to, to, to neutralize human diversity. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at you, I'm thinking, why do you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the question that I No, because everybody has a voice. It's what makes love interesting, it's what makes life interesting. And democracy depends on a diversity of voices. I, otherwise, you don't really have a democracy. You could have one person. <laughs> What does it mean for society? How should societies be to, uh, to be able to let flourish the diversity? Well, you have to be curious, you have to listen, you have to be interested, you have to... You have to the diversity means you can't know the other person without going out and listening to them and asking them questions like you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. What is the most important insight you had so far concerning this is, is what happens when people don't have a voice or feel they don't have a voice or their voice is not listened to or taken seriously, that this is very, first of all, very damaging for the individual uh, and also for the society and for the culture. And that was the situation for many women. And uh, so it's wonderful to be here today and be part of this university's recognizing women's voices. And look at the diversity of even the five of us. There's another thing. We all had different voices, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How can society, you know, be a, a good basis to to let the diversity really flourish? Because it's it's not like that everywhere. No, 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 no. I mean, that's why that film of Malala was so moving, because there's a place where she was not to have a voice, and she did. I think the recognition of the psychologist, we all have a voice. We start with a voice. As humans, as people, we have a voice. And so, and, and you know, really, no one ever loses their voice. But if their voice is... Uh, not listened to or insulted or attacked, then it becomes silent. So then we have to become curious. Where is that person's voice? Mm -hmm. OK, we, we will think about that. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, we will think about that. Thank you very much, and congratulations once again. Thank you so much. Carol Gilligan. Now, finally, we have come to the youngest honorary doctor of the day, a very tough woman, though. Professor Vele de Bosser will introduce Gip Glasses. This is a, a good 
doctorate and a very important doctorate for the Free University of Brussels. First of all, because of the research we do on the social value of sport and elite sport. And Kim is certainly one of the best examples that we could have here. Kim Kleister certainly has been an amazing role model for many people. Kim was always enthusiastic, always positive, always also positive towards other athletes. That is an inspiring role for many people in life. Second, also because of our elite sport and study department that now exists 25 years. One of the best known explanations in the rise of the popularity of the sport is that sport participation is boosted by the wins of champions. In literature this is often called the trickle-down effect or the demonstration effect, but maybe we could just call it the Kim Kleisters effect. For example, if we look here at the memberships in Flanders, and they are represented by these tennis balls, since 1992, when Kim played in junior competitions, she ended the junior competitions in 1998. At the age of 15 years, she ended the fourth in the ranking. Immediately afterwards, she started in senior competition, leading already to Kim being the first Belgian player that was in the final of a Grand Slam on Roland Garros. What we can immediately see here is an increase after her performances of 40% in memberships in Flanders. 2007, unfortunately, she decided to retire because she wanted to become a mother. 2009, she had an amazing comeback with an immediately win of the US Open Grand Slam. 2010, she won the Grand Slam again. In 2011, she won the Australian Open with an immediate result after that. So, although she has stopped playing tennis, the memberships did not go down. We cannot find such an increase in membership in any other sport in Flanders nor in Wallonia. And even maybe more interesting is that at the same time, membership decreased in other countries. High performance sport is said to have a, a boost for the society and to inspire young people but also to increase national pride, to increase a feel-good factor, national recognition. So my question is, should governments invest in high performance sport and why is elite sport important? Als Paulus de Knop, rector studiorum universitatis, et Eduardus van Gelder, prizes concili universitari, Joachimam Kleisters, doctricem honoris causa, creafimus et renuntiafimus. Applaudamus. Kim Kleisters. Congratulations. This is Kleisters. Congratulations, Kim Kleisters. Now, I will pose to you a question that I will never ask a woman again. How do you combine motherhood with a career? They never ask men. But this time I make an exception because I think that motherhood really um, influences your body as a sports uh, athlete. So how did you do it? Combine motherhood with a sports career like you did? Um, besides the, the physical um, work that I had to put in to try and, and recover from, from giving birth and to be a professional top athlete again, um, it took a long time and a lot of hard work. Um, I'm not going to say uh, sit here and say that it was all perfect and it went smoothly and that I never had guilt feelings towards leaving my family to go to practice or to go. I experienced all that. but. 
Um, I think the most important thing is that I had the support from home. Um, you know, my husband, we have a nanny. Um, I wouldn't be able to do those things or to think about my sport and what's best for me to try and be the best tennis player that I could be if I didn't have the support from my husband and from you know, certain people that we worked with at home. Yeah. So it was a, a real choice to combine the two? Yeah. Um, well, when I retired the first time, um, when I, um, and after I did, I never thought that I would come back into tennis as a professional uh, tennis player. Um, so when I started to, you know, play some exhibitions, the motivation to try and be on top of women's tennis again grew stronger. And I was um, very surprised myself and, and worried in a way that um, I had that feeling inside of me, but I didn't, in the beginning, didn't really know or was even worried to explain it to um, my husband and to my, you know, people that I worked with in the past, and, and but gradually that feeling grew stronger, and I couldn't hold it in anymore. And I was like, okay, I, you know, yeah, what you did was I would like to go for it, mm -hmm. and um, is my family willing to to do it with me? Mm -hmm. And they did. Okay, why should we invest in elite sports? Um, well, for me, it's it's easy, <laughs> and another easy question because I got so much out of. Um, being a tennis player, but I was very lucky in the way that I had parents that were professional athletes. And um, when I see the statistics that, that Vela showed up on the screen, I'm very proud that, I'm, that I was able to teach kids or be inspire kids to, to become a tennis player. But the other, maybe the negative side of things is that I hope I didn't exp inspire parents to see their kids as a business or as a product. And that's, I think, where there's, you know, it's important to have involved parents in the upbringing of, um, of athletes or sports players. Yeah. What is the problem in Belgium? Is there a problem for you? Um, it's a... Uh, I know it's a difficult question. I think every country has very talented um, athletes. Um, I think you need to be able to have enough of enough influence um, opportunities, especially. Um, we definitely have opportunities in Belgium. Do I think that the government can be, do more? Yes, of course. I think you know, in, in any part, in arts and sports, there's always opportunities to do more. But I also think that um, it's important to what what the people at you know, ex players like myself, like Justine Hennen, we need to you know, be spokespersons for our sport, and not just for our sport, but just for overall athletes to, to give our experience that great businessmen maybe don't have and, and work together and combine our, our work and our influence together and, and create, you know, one day see another Grand Slam winner in tennis uh, coming from Belgium, that would be great. That yeah, would be great, really. I would also like to have the opinion of the rector um, with his honorary doctorate. The university clearly shows its appreciation for Kim's achievements to date, and I understand that uh, the VUB invests heavily in a performance top sports and study program. So, the same question to you why is this so important for you? Well, imagine that you're a young guy or a young girl. And uh, you have two talents. You are very intelligent. You want to go to university, but you have also sport or cultural uh, talents. Yeah, I think it's unfair that you have to make a choice. Like it's also unfair to make a choice between a career and being a model. So that's why we set up uh, 26 years ago a study and sport program, so that uh, the students at the university can develop both talents. I think the objective of a university is to develop talents, not to cut them off. And besides, also, it's not about all about the degree. Also, the personality is playing a very important role. I think that uh, Kim proved this. Mm -hmm. She earns this uh, honorary doctorate. Uh, so the combination of several facts make you effective and successful in life. Yeah. Would this have been something for you, combining a university, university uh, um, diploma and, and your sports career, or is this really impossible? Um, I think 
up to a certain age, it became impossible for me, unfortunately. Um, or maybe <laughs> for me it was a very easy decision at the time um, because I was always on top of my sport, you know, being eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old. So tennis was always um, a very important interest for me. But on the other hand, I was also brought up with the fact that it was important for me to, to stay involved in school for social skills, um, and to stay grounded, uh, that, that was really important. But also, in sports, everybody knows you can have injuries that can be finished from, finish your career from one day to another, and then, you know, you fall into a black hole. And I think it's important to have a system that you can fall back, back on, especially. Okay, my best wishes, you are Dr. Honoris uh, Causa. Now, congratulations, skip classes. Dear audience, we became acquainted with five extraordinary women, five honorary doctorates on this, if I may say, historical day, females striving for equality. I would like your full attention for the message of Professor Londa Schiebinger. Each year 
over the past nine years. A great accomplishment. This brings us then to our third strategic approach, that is fix the knowledge or integrate gender analysis into research design. This step has to do with the quality of research, it has to do with excellence, it has to do with getting the research right. Gender bias built into society in general and into research institutions in particular creates unconscious gender bias in science and technology. As I said earlier, if we take the example of the 10 drugs that were recently withdrawn from the US market because of their life-threatening effects, we find that eight of those pose greater harm for women. So not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause death and suffering. So we really can't afford to get the research wrong. So I have time to only give you one example of how integrating gender analysis into research can create better science and technology. You can find 21 such specific examples from different fields of science, medicine, and engineering on our Gender Innovation website. This is a project supported by the European Commission, U.S. National Science Foundation, and Stanford University. And so I start with a little story. A couple of years ago, I was in Madrid and interviewed by some Spanish newspapers. When I returned home, I zoomed the articles through Google Translate, and I was shocked that I was referred to as he. Londa Schiebinger, he said, he thought, he wrote, Google Translate has a male default. <laughs> now, how can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? Google Translate defaults to he said because he said is more commonly found on the World Wide Web than she said. And we know from Ngram, another Google product, the ratio of he said to she said has fallen dramatically over the past 30 years. This change in language parallels exactly the women's movement and the massive governmental funding to increase the numbers of women in science. With one algorithm, Google wiped out 30 years of revolution in language, and they didn't need to. This is completely unconscious gender bias. So what do we do? Last July, we held an international collaborative workshop where we invited two machine translation experts, one from Stanford and one from Google. They listened for about 20 minutes, they got it, and they said, we can fix that. So as soon as they got it, as soon as they saw the gender perspective, they started working on a fix. We don't have it yet, but you can see the articles coming out 2012, 2013. It's very exciting. So I can multiply these examples from stem cell research to video games to water infrastructure in sub-Saharan Africa. They're all here. But what I want to, uh, I want to close so that we can enjoy the reception. There are three crucial steps to making men and women equal in universities, and I want you to say them together. I want to hear from you. The first is fix the numbers of women. The second is fix the institutions. And most importantly, very good. You get an A plus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Londa Schievinger. Fix the number of women, fix the institution, and fix knowledge. And now I would like to invite all the honorary doctors for a photograph here in the middle of the stage. I would like to present to you once again the red hot honorary doctors, <laughs> Professor Londa Schiebinger, <laughs> Padu Ben Suda, <laughs> Professor Cecilia Jalsko, <laughs> Professor Carol. Gilligan and Mrs. Kim Clasters. Sincere best wishes for your mark of honor.
And then, please, I would also like the Proximai to join them for a photograph. Can the Proximai please come to stage also here for a photograph? And then, of course, also Rector Falkenhoff and the Chairman of the Board, Eddie van Gelder.
Amatowski, not amateurish at all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us here. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next minutes, I would like your attention for the message of the Minister for Education. But first, I want to share something important with you to be sure that this celebration will end in style. We would like you to stay seated until the honorary doctors, their proximi, the academia, and especially invited persons have left the auditorium. Thanks in advance. And now, straight from Brussels, the Flemish Minister for Education. Pascal Smith. Dear Rector, Professors, dear Honorary Doctors, Ladies and Gentlemen, you will understand that as Minister for Equal Opportunities, as Male Minister for Equal Opportunities, and as Dedication Minister, this is not only a great day for the five great women here present, but also for me from a policy point of view. Gender equality is a high priority for me and for the Flemish government of Belgium. Today, we are witnessing a great statement made by the VUB, my hometown university, and I'm very proud and very grateful for that. This honorary doctorate serves a double purpose. The first, of course, is to recognize the merits of these five great women. Their merits are impressive. They made it to the absolute top in their field of study and they did so as women and for the benefit of women. Professor Jasko by excelling in exit sciences, Fatou Bensouda by using her extraordinary legal talents to combat crimes against women and children, Professor Gillian and Professor Schiebinger by using gender itself as a driving force for renewed and innovative research. And gay, okay. finally, because she is gay. <laughs> and because she realizes, so they say, as a Sunday, Sunday child and mother, that unfortunately, there are also many mothers and children who are born on a blue Monday. I read that she asks herself what she owed the title to. That doubt alone already answers that question. Kim has three masters on her record and received her first one in the year that our universities introduced the term. In addition, she would pass the English test that apparently some in the academic world are fearing a lot these days. And I got an SMS that Victor is somewhere hiding here and he's recording my speech in English. <laughs> Directly broadcast in the Cairo. <laughs> but mainly, she achieved by believing in our powers and my perseverance. Wasn't it Thomas Edison who said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration? The second purpose, ladies and gentlemen, of this Honorary Doctorate Award Ceremony is to give the university itself a face, an identity, an ambition. Universities are not factories where bachelors and masters are produced. They are laboratories of science and technique, hotbeds of debate, workplaces for artists, crossroads of interdisciplinary knowledge and research, and also crossroads between learning and living, between campus and city, between communities of that city, and between cities of Europe and the world. For this university, today's honorary doctorates, first and foremost, wants to be the expression of an ambition, a statement for a university with a gender plan. Ladies and gentlemen, today is a tribute to the bouquet of female talent. And when men show up at home with flowers, it seems that they have to make things up or have done something one is not supposed to do. Of course, I don't know that. <laughs> but I guess that the men of the VB have something to make amends for. Almost 20 years ago, Professor Elswitte was the first and only female rector of a Flemish university. The VUB had a gender lead of 20 years on the University of Ghent and all our other universities. Had, but Els was alone in the lead, and like Fred de Burgrave in swimming, 
One does not only need exceptional talents that confront us with what can be achieved, but also a structure, a state of mind, education, faith, perseverance to confront us with what must be achieved. And that is not always that obvious. We have heard it. More than half of our students are women, but barely a quarter of the professors are women and just one in ten academic leading positions is held by women. Clearly, something must be wrong. And the gender action plan that I grew up with my colleague Ingrid Lieden has to bring about structural change for the bad. A number of measures have already been embedded in Flemish parliamentary acts, and even before the summer recess, all Flemish rectors will sign a charter that will be followed in 2014 by a concrete action plan for every higher education institute. I therefore sincerely hope that today's honorary doctorate's award ceremony is a turning point for our academia in our country, the beginning of true gender equality in our academic world. Mr. Rector, you have raised the ball. Now you have to close the gap too. And that will not be easy. But you have the support of the government, a majority in society, and within your own university, which is inspired by the principle that people can change and shape the future. Dear honorary doctors, thank you for your work, perseverance, and strength. Even more than ever, you will be examples for young people to prove that hope can win. Congratulations and kisses of the government. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Minister, for your nice and inspiring words. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of this ceremony, and it's my pleasure to invite you to a nice reception that will take place outside, in and around the big white marquee. We consider from now the today's honorary doctors as lifelong friends of our university, Let's drink to this friendship. Thank you.